Welcome to the Reason Roundtable podcast, your usually Monday, today, Tuesday podcast from the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Catherine Mangu Ward, and subbing in for an apparently hungover Peter Suderman, yet another ambitious podcast crossover event in the form of National Review's very own funny accented American Charles C. W. Cook. Welcome, Charles, and hello, everyone. Howdy. Hi, Matt. We are going to uh, jump right into the awful news in the Middle East, because why not, uh, here in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors over at Lumen. Before we continue with the Reason Roundtable, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Lumen, the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. Then on the Lumen app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workouts, sleep, and even stress management. All you have to do is breathe into your Lumen first thing in the morning, and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism, whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. Then Lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals, so you know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. I've tried Lumen, and I've got to tell you that it is a great tool for motivation and information. It's easy, and it's fun to use. Your metabolism is your body's engine. It's how your body turns the food you eat into fuel that keeps you going. Because your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, and better sleep. Lumen gives you recommendations to improve your metabolic health. And for women, it can also track your cycle as well as the onset of menopause. And then it adjusts your recommendations to keep your metabolism healthy through hormonal shifts. So you can keep up your energy and stave off cravings. So if you want to take the next step in improving your health, Go to lumen.me slash roundtable to get 15% off your Lumen. That's L-U-M-E-N dot M-E slash roundtable, and you'll get 15% off your purchase. Okay, on Sunday, Israel recovered in a Gaza tunnel underneath the city of Rafa six bodies of October 7th hostages who had been executed quite recently at point blank range by their captors from Hamas. Among the murdered was an American citizen, 23 year old Hirsch Goldberg Poland, whose parents had recently spoken at the Democratic National Convention. Hundreds of uh, thousands of Israelis, uh, anguished and furious, uh, took to the streets over the last couple of days, many of them directing their anger at Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for not doing more to bring the remaining hostages home. Uh, though Israel has now twice agreed to American-led uh, terms for ceasefire hostage swaps, Hamas continues to hold out, with the biggest sticking point now appearing to be who gets to control the narrow strip between Egypt and Gaza, under which most of the area's arms smuggling has taken place. Uh, there are deep divisions, not just within the Israeli public, but also within the war cabinet uh, as well over this uh, Philadelphia corridor obstacle. Catherine, uh, President uh, Joseph uh, Robinette Biden II, when asked Sunday about all this and whether Netanyahu was doing enough to forge a deal, said no, uh, and then insisted that negotiators were very close to a deal and adding that hope springs eternal. Um, given that one side of the negotiating table is literally shooting people in the back of the head, uh, is the president's seemingly unchanged approach towards those negotiations the correct one to take? Yeah, I mean, first of all, absolutely heartbreaking news. Like, I, I guess I had thought maybe I was a little bit numb to some of this news and wrong. I read I read the story of these executions and um, rediscovered how incredibly horrible this conflict is. Um, I did not enjoy Joe Biden's tweet about this at all. And I know that normally I love Joe Biden's tweets so much that you read them to me <laughs> as little gifts on this podcast. Um, but he tweeted, I have worked tirelessly to bring their beloved Hirsch safely to them. And I am heartbroken at the news. I know we're supposed to use I statements and I just used a bunch of them here. But this does not seem like the right context for this this I statement. This is not 
Like how hard Joe Biden worked couldn't be less relevant here. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, the rest of the tweet is fine. Tweet is fine. Hamas will pay. Tragic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Certainly nothing new. Uh, I do not think Joe Biden is adding much to any of these conversations at this point. And, um, you know, what's also not going to add very much when American college students come back this week and have opinions loudly on the lawns of their campuses. So get ready for that. Uh, Nick, I will read to you um, statements from the two leading presidential candidates, neither of them, Joe Biden. Uh, First one comes up uh, from Kamala Harris, who is the vice president of the United States. Uh, Quote, Hamas is an evil terrorist organization. With these murders, Hamas has even more American blood on its hands. I strongly condemn Hamas's continued brutality, and so must the entire world. Now, Donald Trump, uh, the hostages were murdered by Hamas due to a complete lack of American strength and leadership. Make no mistake, this happened because comrade Kamala Harris and crooked Joe Biden are poor leaders. Americans are getting slaughtered overseas. They have blood on their hands. Um, you have thoughts on the two candidates' generalized or specific approach towards the Israeli-Hamas conflict? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that uh, Donald Trump stop having Alex Jones write his tweets. Um, this it, he is as delusional and out of it on this score as uh, as Joe Biden, I think, um, uh, uh, in in this sense. This is not about the United States and anything else. This is about Israel and Gaza. And it is, you know, one thing this reminds us. And as Catherine was saying, you know, as the school year begins, Hamas is not a, a legitimate government. Hamas is a terrorist organization that spends most of its time committing unspeakable crimes, theft and corruption against its own people. And then when it ranges out into Israel and just kills a bunch of, you know, absolutely innocent people, uh, they need to be condemned squarely for that and ultimately kicked out of any kind of leadership role in Gaza. I don't think that's for the United States to dictate. And what this episode reminds us of uh, is the fact that the the way that the U.S. interacts, not just with Israel, but with every country in the Middle East, is problematic. Um, I'm a big believer in what Jacob Siegel and Leo Leibovitz, Leibovitz in Tablet have talked about, which is the need for Israel and the United States to separate their defense uh, interactions uh, because it is not helping either country. Uh, There seems to be very little question that the United States, to the extent that it put pressure on Israel, um, it did so uh, to reduce the immediacy and the strength of its response that might have ended all of this much quicker. But by the same token, it also uh, it, it, it makes it impossible for us to be an honest broker in that area. We're either giving aid or, you know, to all of the major countries in the area, uh, Egypt, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, Jordan, as well as Israel. Um, but then we also have a massive military base in Qatar. We need to really rethink how we deal with this kind of stuff so that Israel can defend itself properly. Uh, you know, the, the Obama administration of all people in 2018 signed a deal with Israel, which essentially made Israel have to buy and spend all of the aid that we give it in the U.S. for U.S. military industrial complex uh, vendors. Um, That's problematic, I think. So, you know, this is a reminder of two things. One is that not everything is about the United States and that to the extent that we have a policy that starts to reflect that, I think we'll actually have more peace in the world rather than an ongoing stalemate, which is, you know, helping nobody at this point. Charles, I know you're one of us now and uh, and thank God for that. But I know that you also still speak British. Um, so I wanted you to, to get a reaction from the, uh, the about the new Labour government. That's with the EU, apparently. Um, they announced yesterday that it, it is suspending uh, 30 arms export licenses to Israel. Uh, can you translate what that means? Uh, any potential effects and kind of where Labour is at with the whole state of Israel situation? Well, the Labour Party in England is in a much better place as regards Israel and, in general, Jewish people than it was under Jeremy Corbyn, who I think it is fair to say was actually somewhat hostile towards uh, Jews per se. I don't think that would be fair to accuse the Labour Party of now. Uh, That said, I think that the Labour Party still suffers from what I see, and I guess in this regard I disagree a little bit with Nick, as a failure of 
um, moral or diplomatic clarity when it comes to Israel and its role. I mean, if if I would agree with the statement that was made that we overstate America's role in world affairs. Um, I think Trump likes to portray everything that happens in the world as being somehow tied to the United States. This one does, of course, touch the United States because there was an American citizen involved and killed. Um, that said, uh, I think America, as I think Britain, uh, should have encouraged Israel to go in as hard as they could and should not have been using back channels to uh, discourage um retaliation and the clearing of Hamas, because I think Hamas is flatly evil and can't be negotiated with. Um, so uh, I think what you're seeing in Britain is, uh, which has never had the same relationship with Israel the United States does, uh, is... Never? Um, <laughs> yeah. well, I had a much worse... Uh, how long time. How long is that time yeah. frame? You're yeah, working fair, on fair yeah. enough, yeah. fair enough. Um, <laughs> Which in the modern era does not have the same relationship. Um, it, you're seeing the same. Uh, what's the best way of putting this? So, if you think about the way that the, the Biden Harris administration is trying to navigate this, they uh, simultaneously do truly believe, I think, that Hamas is evil, and are also aware that many within their coalition don't, um, or at least think that the issue is very complicated. And I think the Labour Party is full of the same sort of divisions where there's no dispute over Hamas being bad, but there are more people who think this is some sort of manifestation of imperialism or um, history rather than a, a simple Manichaean problem. Catherine, building on some of that, um, the White House had uh, successfully dissuaded Israel from invading Rafah for about three months uh, with Kamala Harris at the time saying, and she's been widely seen up until now as one of the most dovish voices within the White House uh, talking about this comparatively. Um, she said at the time, quote, I have studied the maps. There's nowhere for those folks to go. Um, Israel eventually did go into Rafah and moved one million people. They went somewhere. Um, and uh, now they're finding hostages there, both alive and dead. Do those results change the wisdom uh, or calculation of that effort by the U.S. to say, slow your roll? I mean, it just seems like, broadly speaking, there's no reason at all why Kamala Harris and a map should be... <laughs> a deciding element of this equation, uh, or that it should at least, at the very least, be a very, very small piece of the puzzle. Uh, I have also looked at some maps, and I have an opinion. But you know what? Who cares? Who cares? This is not something that I can understand in detail. It's not something where I bear the consequences. Uh, and as a result, I don't think it's something where I or kind of the American people generally should be the deciders. I mean, this is, you know, we've talked about this on this podcast, but I think we can reliably assume that all of the folks that have been quoted so far, American politicians, their decision making is being driven 87 percent by the upcoming U.S. election. And uh, maybe I won't speculate on on what's going on with the rest, but um, that's not the right that's not the right balance. A lot of um, a lot of these questions are simply shouldn't be subject to American political concerns, and the fact that they are um, really points to how broken the entire kind of geopolitical ecosystem around this decision making is. Nick, one of the uh, I think differences between the traditional Trump approach to this war and the White House and or Kamala Harris has been Trump has repeatedly said on the campaign trail that basically we should stop handcuffing Israel. They should be out there to finish the job however they see necessary to root out Hamas. That sounds a little bit like the Nick Gillespie um, approach that you sort of articulated earlier. What do you say to our libertarian brethren, small L in this case, but sometimes large L as well, um, who are just horrified by that? Like you are basically endorsing a stepped up war against a trapped civilian population that's largely young and pretty miserable. Uh, you know, uh, two things. And first, going back to Donald Trump for a second, you know, the problem with Trump's response is that he's not even talking about America. He says that all world events uh, proceed 
directly from his action or inaction, because he says the same thing about Ukraine. One of the biggest problems historically with American foreign policy, and you can think back to somebody like John F. Kennedy, who you know had some kind of personality grudge with uh, Fidel Castro and others that actually directed behavior that, you know, it's it's not about the U.S. and it's certainly not about Donald Trump. Um, and it worries me deeply that we might be reelecting a person who thinks that way. Um, and it's not to say Trump's foreign policy was not awful by any stretch or anything like that, but it's like, you, you know, foreign policy is about systems thinking. It's not about like, okay, you know, if Donald Trump could just get in there and say, no, go left, you know, and then everything would be fixed. That is a, a deeply, deeply troubling problem, especially from a libertarian perspective. When it comes to Israel and Hamas, um, you know, Israel is not by any means a perfect state. But I think when we start to f be incapable of drawing a clear moral line between what Hamas did on October 7th and everything else, then I, I don't I don't even know what the next bit of conversation is, um, because it's not to say that people in Gaza and people in the West Bank don't have legitimate grievances against the Israeli government. Uh, Matt, you have often said that the October 6th status quo was unsustainable. And I think that's true. And that has to be dealt with. But, you know, in, in the wake of what happened on October 7th, and particularly among a lot of Americans, including some libertarians, I think it's mostly not libertarians who are saying, you know, what Hamas did is not only, you know, understandable in the grand scheme of things, but is actually worthy of some kind of a claim uh, or something like that. That just is flat out wrong. Um, and, you know, Israel, Israel will decide what is best for its, you know, uh, security perimeter and things like that. And it may end up being that it is not particularly libertarian. By all indications that I've seen so far, the actual fighting in Gaza, which is, you know, massive and ongoing, it has also been done with the type of care that is rarely seen in urban war uh, warfare situations. So, you know, I'll leave it there. Charles, um, the question of retrieving hostages has proven damnably uh, difficult, uh, not just for Israel, but also the United States, um, both in Iran, in Russia, Iraq. It is bedeviled basically more than half of the last 10 American presidencies, uh, Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter, probably most notoriously, but also Bill Clinton and, and others. Uh, is there in your mind like uh, some kind of of through line or, or let's say uh, at some kind of reset that can happen. Like we've been doing globally in the sort of rich democratic West, we've been doing hostages wrong. We need to stop doing it this way. Or is it just, you know, a forever difficult thing to do? Oh, I think it's a forever difficult thing to do. I do think we don't help ourselves in the way we talk about it though. I mean, I am of the view that one of the main reasons we have a government, one of the reasons I'm willing to tolerate the existence of a federal government is so that if I'm abroad and some awful terrorist organization steals me, that I can expect the Navy SEALs to come through the door. Uh, but there are other considerations I accept than my well-being. But we don't talk about it as if there are. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't expend every effort. I think we should. I would almost want to send a gunboat a la Palmerston, um, given what happened to this American citizen uh, who was just shot in the head. But if you remember, not that it's quite a hostage situation, but if you remember the way that Biden talked about the recent uh, prisoner exchange and that Obama uh, talked about the return of Bo Bergdahl, uh, both of them said the same thing. <laughs> they said, well, we don't leave people behind. We would do anything to get them back, which isn't true. Right? You, we wouldn't, for example, have said, well, yes, we will get Bo Bergdahl back and you get an aircraft carrier of ours. Right? We just It's not true we would have done everything. There is a line somewhere. I, that's not a facetious point. It's just obviously and self-evidently true. And I think the same problem uh, obtains with hostages, which is that we talk about it as if there is literally nothing that would stand in the way of our getting our hostages back. But of course there is. Of course there are considerations. So I do think this is absolutely uh, fixed and, and uh, unfixable. Uh, but I also think that uh, we ought to talk 
more like that. Um, <laughs> as if every single one is sui generis, every single one requires us to evaluate how best we uh, deal with it. Because what we have done is we've created these false expectations now where people say, well, you didn't go and get this person and therefore you have failed. And that's not always fair. I um, love that right. the ghost in uh, like all of foreign policy discussion is just like utilitarianism like it's just like philosophical right, consequentialism right. like people who are out here thinking of themselves as deontologists like as Kantians are like yeah but like obviously we don't let our principles take us to try and they, and rightly so like I'm right. in favor of this outcome but I do think it's uh it, it always clashes with people's self-perception on these matters yeah. which makes the co talking about it a lot harder all right uh speaking of uh, Kamala Harris last Thursday 33 days uh, after uh, Joe Biden withdrew from the 2024 presidential race, finally sat down for an interview with a journalist. Uh, Dana Bash from CNN, also there and occasionally talked to, was Coach Tim Walls, uh, her vice presidential pick. Uh, it was Assistant about Coach Matt Welch. Wow. <laughs> Can't let it go. In all caps. Uh, yeah. It was about 30 minutes, about 30 questions. There was some word salading, definitely uh, some evasive language. Uh, not much cackling nor coconuts uh, this time around, but maybe in the next interview that she does six months from now, we'll see more of that. Uh, Catherine, what did we learn, if anything, about uh, Kamala Harris, about Tim Walls, about journalism, about America? You know, given the volume of ink that was spilled in service of trying to answer that question in the days after the interview, I have to say, I think we learned nothing. I think we learned absolutely nothing. Like, we kind of knew who this lady was already, and uh, she was like a decent version of that gal. I, you, I do feel that you could see, like, scrolling like a little ticker behind her eyes, like, just don't riff like just don't like don't do the <laughs> coconuts thing don't laugh like you could you could like just see her like i can i know i can make it through this interview without saying something that can be like clipped and memed and and she did she made it through the interview without saying something that could be clipped and memed. but even if she had not succeeded in that mission i still don't i mean i didn't come away with any new information certainly didn't come away with any new information about her public policy positions about what she might do as president, which is a question I, a viewer, am somewhat interested in. But Nick, uh, her values haven't changed. Yeah, no. Her her positions on things could change, but her values haven't, which is kind of fascinating. And I mean, I, you know, this was a placeholder. She has a strategy which was kind of clear before this, but is obvious now, which is that she is just going to try and run out the clock. Um, without actually committing to anything or saying anything. And politically, that's not a bad strategy. But, you know, if we are uh, holding politicians to the barest levels of, you know, kind of moral or meaningful standards, it's, it's, it's just insufferable. Um, it is, you know, she has she didn't say anything other than that she wants to give $6,000, you know, fr free money to people with kids, right? Or if, if you fuck and have a kid, but, you know, when she's in office, you're going to get uh, $6,000, right? That's Something a, like um, that. That's a tease for hopefully a later segment here. Please don't uh, use the word okay. tease. I, yeah, I, I, you know, uh, but um, and then the other thing, you know, she did have her emotional support human, Tim Walls, there. And my question about him is like, why was he there? Because <laughs> he didn't really answer anything. Right. And, and then it's like, you know, Matt, and I realize I've been saying this to my fiance, even to my own grown children and pastors by in the streets. And I don't get a good response, but I have to speak <laughs> my truth, which is, you know, Tim Walls is a teacher. He was a high school teacher. He was a fucking football coach. And he was the type of uh, National Guardsman who gets out the minute he's actually going to have to actually go fight somewhere. Um, he's like three for three. He checks all the boxes of the type of person that we should not be uh, glamorizing, much less making uh, you know the uh, vice president of the United States. So I think he accomplished something there. I think in fairness, presidents usually do sit down with their vice presidential pick. What's unusual in this case is that this is the only interview that she has done now in going on. I'm just trying to count about six weeks uh, since uh, being in the campaign. That's insane. Uh, Charles, are you able to 
Um, just, I, I know that you're a, not just a double hater, but I think a quadruple hater when we throw in the vice presidential uh, picks. Well, you can add well. Robert yeah. F. Kennedy Jr. too. So well, he's too. kind of out. So like, you gotta, you gotta find a new one. Jill Except, Stein. Dr. Except Jill. I can hate her if you like. Yeah. Uh, I, I try on Twitter today with some success, by which I mean like two people noticed, I tried to uh, unveil the triple hater. Uh, uh, idea to include the media as well. Mm -hmm. uh, where did where did your kind of lump of bile uh, fixate on in this process? Was it with the candidates? Was it with the journalist? Uh, or was it was it with the people who have spent the last X numbers of years nattering about uh, the constitutional threat to democracy and who now are like, yeah, whatever. She doesn't need to give interviews. I just, well, I'm sorry, before you answer, I have to just interrupt and speak on behalf of reason and say that we do not tolerate the phrase, where did her lump of, where did your lump yeah. of bile fixate? Like that. That's, what do you, what do you mean I tolerate? Just, that's a, I, I, wanna, I just want to be clear image. that that <laughs> will not stand. Go ahead. Mm. I landed everywhere, rained everywhere. I, I <laughs> look. It's a champagne supernova. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a lump of bile. <laughs> Where were you while we were getting bile? Yeah. I, look, I <laughs> I think that it was a reminder of the terrible situation we're in, in the sense that if Donald Trump were not the Republican nominee, and if Joe Biden had not been essentially forced to step down because he seemed dead that interview would have been widely regarded as a catastrophe. It's only because Donald Trump is incapable of speaking in full sentences as well, and Joe Biden is incapable of getting through um, a sentence, that it didn't seem what it was, which was, which was a, a joke. Um, and, you know, you ask about the media, it was a joke on both sides of the microphone in that the... the Questions were also answers. And I saw every lawyer that I follow on Twitter saying that in a courtroom, half of those questions would have been thrown out for leading the witness. I mean, Dana Bash just kept saying, well, why did this terrible thing that you have done happen? Is it because? And she would give two or three options. And like my six-year-old at school, they would circle the one that they thought was least damaging and least likely to get them in trouble. So... You know, I mean, I describe this as a catastrophe, not because I think it's going to be necessarily catastrophic for her campaign. I think Nick's right. I think that her uh, approach is probably going to work. Just just run out the clock. But as a citizen and as as a voter, it was it was it was a joke. I mean, you you just you think about the United States of America and all of the people who have been orators and thinkers and public figures within it. <laughs> You know, Abraham Lincoln is an American citizen, and then you watch this election, and that was just another great example of it. Um, I let's go in a quick round of biggest unasked uh, question or opportunity missed. I will lead us. Uh, I was uh, amazed that Dana Bash couldn't figure out a way to ask um, about Kamala Harris's response to Robert Hur's report back in February, because not only. Uh, did she say, oh, that's, you know, that's I don't agree with his assessment that the president is a kindly old man who's kind of losing his faculties. Um, uh, I she said that this whole report was clearly politically motivated and doesn't resemble any truth that she can see. Uh, that's what she said in February of this year, after which the White House spent several months very successfully mow mowing media organizations to uh, to be more exercised by cheap fakes of yeah. Joe Biden stumbling around than the very evident fact to a majority of even Democrats that the dude was too old. Um, so she didn't find a way to ask that. She instead uh, sort of said, uh, do you regret the way that you um, came out and supported him after his uh, disastrous debate performance, after which Kamala Harris just talked about what a great American. Like, no, you threw a career DOJ prosecutor under the bus uh, and lied. Uh, I kind of want to know when you lied and how that happened. Catherine, what did you uh, think that was an, a missed question that you would like to hear her answer? 
Uh, I would commend to our listeners uh, Connor Friedersdorf's piece in The Atlantic uh, last week in which he offered several, I think, seven questions uh, for Harris, mostly about her criminal justice record. Uh, There's just so much that has still remained um, unanswered in uh, in the kind of mismatch between her stated late career principles and her conduct as a as a prosecutor, um, as you know, as a G. Um, specifically the, his questions about her, um, her willingness to look the other way or even defend, uh, officers credibly accused of various types of abuse and misconduct. So, um, I just like, there's, there's one place where she actually has a detailed record that she can be held personally directly accountable for. And, um, that was really not discussed at all in the interview in any kind of depth. Nick, what would you have liked to have seen? Uh, You know, the fracking question, which I think you were alluding to before, where her position from 2019 to whenever has changed, but she insists that her principles have it. Um, You know, that's kind of fascinating. But more broadly, the whole idea that she was kind of uh, pretending that Donald Trump was the incumbent. Um, And that just kind of went unchallenged whatsoever. And it was like, yeah, okay, uh, you know, Trump, Let's talk about Trump's, you know, legacy and things like that. But you've been part of the administration that's been in place since 2021. Let's focus on that and act as if you have been vice president and the, uh, you know, unnamed czar, czarina of various things that have not gone well. Let's talk about that. Charles, any uh, any area? Yeah, well, I just wanted to follow up after the my values haven't changed question because it wasn't sufficient to explain the policy changes and the policy changes are extraordinary and much as nobody seems to be willing to ask donald trump a series of questions about this tariff proposal which would completely change the american economy uh, no one seems to care that at a point in 2019 harris not only said that she wanted to pass a bill co-sponsored a bill that would kick 170 million people off their current health insurance plans. Whatever you think of the health system, that would be the effect of it, given the path dependency of where we are. Uh, And then she sort of glibly laughed about it in that interview. She said, yeah, let's move on, you know, as if it was nothing. And there was no question about this. And so that combined with the Green New Deal, these are enormous enormous policy areas that would just let go oh, well that was one of her foibles five years ago we were all young you know i just i can't believe that well i can't believe because the media is disgraced but but there was no follow-up on this um just as there's no follow-up on on this tariff stuff where both candidates are essentially saying i'm going to completely change the entire world next question yeah mm-hmm. all right we're gonna get to our listener i do email. think it raises if i may just real quick it raises well, the stakes for the uh debate and i hope we'll have more of them You got to say, you know, generally speaking, uh, after the national conventions, presidential debates are just like kind of bullshit. Um, But this year, we've already had one that was incredibly informative. And I think seeing Trump and Harris go at each other, it will bring a lot of clarity to who each of them is and why all of us should be applying for Canadian citizenship right now. I mean, just Uh, the tariff questions of that debate alone should be worth the price of admission. Just like you guys seem to have the same horrific policy, kind of. No, I'm worse. I'm worse. I'm telling you, I'm worse. Even worse. Discuss. Like, I, I just that. Just if someone could ask that, that would be great. There's uh, I saw some interview over the weekend where uh, Trump was talking about uh, President McKinley. We were arguably richer, more rich than than we are now. Uh, all right, we're going to get to our listener email of the week yeah. here in a moment. But first, <laughs> a word from our sponsor over at the University of Chicago. Go Maroons! Uh, friends, in an election year, it's all too easy to get overwhelmed by the constant buzz of news and opinions. Uh, understanding the true impact of political events can be a challenge. So have we got a podcast for you. Not another politics podcast from the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy, who provides clear research-driven perspectives on the biggest issues of the day, week, and season. Get the insights you need to truly understand the political landscape. No spin, just facts. Subscribe today at harris.uchicago.edu 
slash N-A-P-P. That's harris.uchicago.edu slash N-A-P-P. Conversely, you can just look for Not Another Politics Podcast wherever you acquire your podcasts more generally. Do it today. You'd be glad you did. All right. A reminder, send your brief queries to roundtable at reason.com. This comes from Colin Firm, uh, who writes uh, in part and with my interjections, I'm an American living in Germany for six plus years, but I was in the States when the Backpage founders, Mike Lacey and Jim Larkin, were arrested by our now hallowed vice presidents. Now, after several failed prosecutions, the one surviving founder is on the eve of being sentenced for a single financial crime charge. He was sentenced last week to five years in prison. Uh, the judge has stated that she will take, quote, non-convicted conduct, unquote, into account, which is apparently a feature of the federal system when it comes to sentencing. My question to you is, when is it right to revolt? When can we deem the system so broken that it's fair to stand up to it and say no? A lot of the discussion I've had with friends basically say that it needs to be 1984, meaning the George Orwell novel. Uh, and then, yeah, that's fine. But when we have convictions of people for minor tax crimes potentially being sentenced for sex trafficking, is our system even just? Since the U.S. Uh, only has two parties and neither are interested in a basic justice problem like this, where is the justice for people like Mike Lacey? And when is it appropriate to actually take action to stop these kinds of miscarriages of justice? Catherine, are you ready to bomb some stuff? I am never ready to bond some stuff, Matt. You know that about me. Uh, now and always, I would like to see the world burn, but I do want it to be a controlled burn. Always. <laughs> I want to just dig little trenches. I want to have guys with hoses, and then we just, right? But only where we meant Gendering to burn it. firemen, whatever. Uh, the, <laughs> the, Convicts. Um, Convicts, yeah, but we should pay them a just wage and let them yeah. be licensed as firefighters when they get out, as you know. Um yeah, like I, I am outraged about the the sentence that Lacey has received and the way in which it has been arrived at. Um, I'm outraged at the entire back page prosecution. And I do think uh, looking to the two major parties to help resolve the source of that outrage is a fool's errand. I am also a quintuple hater or whatever we are now. Um, but, uh, you know, I I think... The letter writer leaves unclear uh, the precise details of what his revolt would look like. And unfortunately, so many of them are uh, counterproductive, unproductive um, and in violation of the non-aggression principle. And we don't like to do that here. Um, but, yeah, we should get mad about it. We should yell about it. We should protest about it. And uh, we should also do the very important meta thing that we can do here, which is be sure that everyone's rights to uh, due process and to speech are protected so that the powers that be can't just continue on their merry way pretending like all this is fine. Uh, Nick, what do you uh, do to prevent uh, nihilistic revolutionary fervor from rising like mm. bile in your esophagus? Yeah, like bile in my lymph nodes. <laughs> uh, you know, I think everybody has to it makes this calculation for themselves. I'll drop something into the show notes, Matt. It's the clip of Mario Savio or Savio, uh, the uh, spokesman for the uh, uh, free speech movement that uh, was birthed in Berkeley. And the triggering episode there was not being allowed to leaflet uh, to talk about Freedom Summer and going down to, uh, you know, get volunteers to go down south and register voters in the uh, early 60s. That was his breaking point when he said, you know, there comes a point where you have to throw your body on the machine and say no. That can take a lot of different forms. It can take violent protests, which I'm generally against, especially in a country like America that actually absorbs critique and kind of moves along and reforms itself in powerful ways that we need to recognize and constantly be talking about, because this is part of the whole you know, set of all kinds of disruption over the past four or five years has been the idea that nothing has changed since 1948 or 19 or 1896 or whatever. That's a fundamentally flawed assumption. We actually reform all the time. And the way we do that is by make, you know, shouting uh, bloody murder, by putting our bodies against the machine, by changing the terms in which we discuss things, in electing different people, in reading Reason magazine, and bringing that to bear on everyday decisions. So 
Um, I think all of us need to throw our bodies on the machine, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you go, you know, that suddenly you start camping out at Columbia and praising Hamas for killing a bunch of innocent people. You know, uh, the way that we change things is through dialogue, discussion, voting, uh, and leaving and building our own world that we want to live in peacefully and perfectly, where we actually persuade people to join our tribe rather than stick with something that's going down the tubes. I would add that it's also helpful to uh, read those, you know, libertarians who are trapped in conservative magazines. Charles, um, mm. <laughs> pick <laughs> pick any part of this that you want. The revolt, the back page, the uh, federal government deciding that if you actually try to defend yourself in any meaningful way, that they are definitely going to make an example out of you. Whatever you want. Well, there is a paradox here, isn't there? I mean, we have a country with a set of founding documents that we revere, but those founding documents are revolutionary. Although the people who wrote them were not revolutionary too quickly. I mean, even in 1775, John Adams was skeptical. It took quite a lot to get him to the point of accepting it. I just start from the position that most revolutions are bad. I think the American Revolution was terrific. Um, I also think relative to the tyrannies of the past, the tyranny that was suffered by the colonists was fairly weak. If you compare... <laughs> wow. Well, I'm not saying that You can take the Englishman out of England, <laughs> out of old Blighty, but you can't... Yeah. yeah. But, but it is an interesting thing I've written a bit about, that if you look at the complaints of the colonists, all of which I agree with, uh, compared to, say, what was experienced under Nazi Germany or Maoist China or the Soviet Union, they're, they're nothing. I mean, those people would have laughed in the faces of <laughs> Samuel Adams. Maybe compared to, like, India. Well, this is the point, though, is that, but, but I think they would have, of course, had a right to revolt. They would have had a right to revolt. Um, and I think there are various points in American history, too, at which a revolution would have been justified. Slavery would absolutely justified, um, a revolution that never came. Um, but I just don't think in 2024, with many of the changes that we've made, that what would replace the United States would be better than it. And so as a you know, conservative, <laughs> libertarian, libertarian, conservative, classical liberal, whatever you will, that's always my starting thought. And so, yeah, it would take an enormous amount. What's the phrase in the declaration? Not for light and transient causes. Um, maybe you don't have to get to 1984. The, the other paradox, of course, is that I say all this and I believe what I'm saying. I also have 13 guns just in case. So I, I suppose that I'm not I'm not averse. <laughs> even Only in 13? You're Only. like part of the cathedral. Then. It's one yeah. for each colony. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I would just add that one of the things that stuck in my craw of last week's sentencing is that the prosecutor uh, in the case who's part of the um, Department of Justice Obscenity Task Force, which still exists. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, for a, a, a yeah. category of speech that technically should not exist. Um, uh, the prosecutor uh, wanted to make sure that there was no like self-release in the meantime, no bail, yeah. that uh, that Mike Lacey and the uh, co-defendants would always be under uh, uh, surveillance and locking key because he didn't want a, quote, flight by suicide. Yeah. <laughs> That's a phrase. Flight by suicide. On the suicide, wings of angels, yeah. The feds say uh, it is just appalling and it is uh, continues to be an appalling thing that this case and all the cases that led up to it and the retrial that's going to happen again because you got to try them three times to really make sure um, have not been uh, paid attention to very much by people who otherwise like to uh, tear your ear off about the anti-free speech actions of Elon Musk or whoever the hell. Uh, this is a free speech outrage against a longtime newspaper publisher for providing a forum that other people used in ways that people didn't like. Um, it's awful. All right. Uh, lightning round-ish time. Last week, uh, former and future President uh, Donald J. Trump announced that he would uh, support the government covering the entire cost for in vitro fertilization, that's IVF, for you uh, keeping score at home, uh, saying, uh, quote, we want to produce babies in this country, right? <laughs> Sorry. Try and, try and, 
Uh, Trump also indicated that when it comes to prohibiting abortion, quote, we need more than six weeks. This was an apparent reference to an amendment in Florida where uh, Charles Cook lives, uh, but it's impossible to figure out what side of that amendment uh, Trump is on. He said a lot of different uh, things. Uh, Charles, I know you hate this and everything else. Um, uh, does some of this indicate, though, that uh, conservatives, having kind of won the long fight at the Supreme Court level on abortion in particular, are uh, uh, feeling the political heat about reproductive uh, related uh, policy? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I'm a pro lifer. I think abortion is killing. I'm also losing that argument. And we live in a country in which that matters. And I think this shows two things. First off, uh, that Republicans are losing the substantive argument. They were absolutely uh, correct on the legal argument against Roe. And uh, I think they prevailed because they were right. Uh, But the public is not interested in implementing a broad pro-life program, either at the state level or the federal level. And Trump's trying to win the White House and understands that. And the second thing that is happening is that I don't think that Trump actually is pro-life at all. I think he understands that he has to pretend to be in some measure to be the Republican nominee. And he does have to pretend to be in some measure to be the Republican nominee because the party still has a lot of pro-lifers whose votes he needs to win. But you can tell you know, for the last 10 years um, that his prior position on abortion, which was well documented in books that he'd written or interviews he'd given, <laughs> is his real one. And the combination of his not being a pro-lifer or really understanding why anyone is and the fact that Uh, abortion is a 70-30 or 80-20 issue in the pro-choice side's favor at the moment has led to what we're now seeing from him. Catherine, uh, you're a lady. Um, Can you explain to us exactly (laughs) what that IVF subsidy She identifies as a lady, (laughs) Matt. Come on. Uh, No, I'm declaring it. Uh, uh, Matt Walsh and I are twinned. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. What is, what is, what would that, so paying for all of IVF, what does that look like? It looks like Obamacare, which I thought Republicans didn't like. Uh, You know, Obamacare had uh, a bunch of things in it that were like, oh, yeah, um, we're just adding stuff that's politically popular to mandatory coverage because uh, we would like to win elections. And uh, this is exactly the same thing. Um, I, uh, for one, uh, welcome our new pro-choice overlords, regardless of which party they are from. Um, And uh, and you know, I guess sort of in a horrible mirror image of the tariff uh, convergence, uh, I'm delighted that no matter who wins, we'll probably have a fairly pro-choice president. So good news there. Um, The fact that it is coming out in this bonkers IVF plan, um, which, you know, it it is absolutely a medical (laughs) treatment that people are currently rationing based on prices. It's very, very, very expensive to get IVF. And people make choices about how many cycles to do, how many courses to do based on what they can afford. And I personally would like to see those signals in an awful lot more of healthcare, especially that which is discretionary. Um, moving away from that would be a, a quite serious mistake. Um, but Donald Trump is right. Six weeks is not enough time. Six weeks is uh, I don't know I'm pregnant yet. Six weeks is I don't have any information. Six weeks is I don't have any time to do logistics. Um, and the American people broadly agree with that. And I'm happy to see that sentiment reflected in uh, the more pro-choice of the parties. Uh, Nick, are Charles's tears more del- of the delicious? Party, Uh, No, but, uh, you know, he's right that Donald Trump, you know, in books that he never wrote or never read has, you know, talked about how like, you know, he's good with infanticide up until whatever, you know, uh, the whatever age Barron went through puberty, I guess he's like, okay, now he he can support himself or something like that. Um, But um, there there he doesn't understand where pro lifers are coming from. And as a result, like this IVF thing is going to get them into more trouble because the more extreme pro-lifers are, you know, one of the problems with IVF is that it can produce dozens of, uh, you know, uh, unborn children who are ever flock, you know, who are ever locked in a frozen purgatory in a lab somewhere. Um, so 
one thing that people forget who become pro-Trump is like whatever he does to your enemies, he he is acid and he's going to eat through your own set of issues and concerns just as much. And he's been doing that pretty spectacularly through the Republican Party. And now it's turning to the abortion thing. Uh, the other thing that I, I just want to say, because it's not just Donald Trump, J.D. Vance is so great. All of his bullshit on this, where he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're not against abortion, you know, but I uh, blah, but I am against abortion and IVF. Like he has become the greatest armchair OBGYN since Andrew Sullivan was demanding that he get to sift through Sarah Palin's placenta to figure out what was going on with trap or trigger or trog, whatever her kid's name was. If you remember that, man. Yes, uh, fondly. Yeah, you know, and it's just like Vance is, it, I mean, he has become, you know, and he's obviously like a smart guy, I guess, semi-accomplished, all of that kind of stuff. And he has, within a matter of weeks, has become the type of, um, you know, just universal joke that is kind of amazing. But a lot of it is because over the years, he just keeps talking about you know, these women and their lady parts, like they really need to get on the wagon or get off or become, you know, if they're postmenopausal, they got to be taking care of my kids. You know, they got ice skating practice in the afternoons and they need a ride, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's like, it's kind of amazing. I Can just I love- also just very briefly say the mini kerfuffle, whatever it was two weeks ago around uh, exactly what fertility treatment the walls is used, yeah. uh, I think- It's so interesting because it really does reveal the extent to which uh, people misunderstand so deeply the conservative concerns about IVF specifically. Um, And, you know, the concern is, as Nick wildly inelegantly put it, um, you uh, you make you make all these embryos. And if you think that the embryos are. Um, entities that have kind of moral weight that you you then have a very difficult ethical problem. Um, and that is uh, part of IVF. It is not part of using an IUI, which mm. seems to be the treatment that the wall is actually used. Literally no one opposes that treatment. And the fact that they are willing to lump those together to purposely choose to misunderstand where conservatives are, where pro-lifers are in this, like, it's actually a hard question. Like it's one where my views are clear, but uh, and they are on the side of you know letting people use this technology. And um, uh, but it's fair to worry about that. And the fact that the Democratic Party not only wants to pretend to not understand it, maybe they really don't understand it, is actually quite troubling. Oh, I, I, but and you know Charles is here. He, he might want to speak for himself, but it also reveals the extremity or extremeness of the pro-life position, because most people are not against IVF and most people do not think that a fertilized egg is the equivalent of a post-birth child. Um, And so it forces a conversation. I'm not saying, obviously, you know, Tim Walls himself was lying to get the IVF vote. He was the one who introduced the confusion over how his uh, wife got pregnant. But this is the type of thing when you start to get into the details, you realize it is very complicated and it has been working against the pro-life side because they come out as super extreme where even having this conversation about conception might mean that none of us can, you know, have abortions because whatever kid we're talking about in potential, you know, is protected by the laws of God. You Charles, probably you can, can't have an abortion anyway, Nick. Just uh, give it time. Give it probably. time. I'm very hopeful that we'll have the technology before I kick the bucket. Charles, you can quickly defend your honor. Well, I don't believe in God, so my pro-life position doesn't come from that. And that's probably one reason why I'm a lot less worried about IVF than I am about abortion, which is uh, not just um, uh, an egg, uh, but is a human being who, if left alone, will become a, a grown-up <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think that this is a problem because uh, God is sitting there watching or religious books as it is or because there is a soul uh, or anything metaphysical at all. Uh, I just uh, don't think that given a choice we should destroy um, a human being and I, I do think uh, that after conception, a, a human being has been created. I, IVF is in a sort of pre-position before that, which becomes more complicated. 
final thought on that is just that the uh, the Republican Party platform, which fun fact exists this time around, um, <laughs> it, Neat. In, includes a lot of uh, includes support for uh, individual states to pursue personhood amendments to their constitution. Um, personhood amendments are widely understood as being objectively anti IVF for reasons that we've already gotten into. Okay, let's go to our end of show, what we have been consuming in the cultural arena. Catherine, why don't you lead us by example? We were just talking about the founding documents and a variety of other relevant uh, subjects. And so I want to talk about what I watched with my family this weekend, which was National Treasure. What a great movie, you guys. I don't know how long it's been since you have seen it, but I cannot urge you strongly enough (laughs) to rewatch it. We were just like looking, you know, it was like family movie night. I was looking for something good. And um, what a banger. Among other things (laughs) that I had forgotten, uh, a central part of the plot hinges on the fact that daylight savings is bullshit. Uh, Like just just that's just one tiny detail in just a flawless action sequences. Very, very self-aware, very enjoyable and multiple genuinely stirring speeches about the American experiment and the beauty and brilliance of the founders' words and ideas. I mean, I was like, I laughed. I cried. I got mad about daylight savings time. I wish I had these cool secret code glasses um, (laughs) that they have that they find behind a brick, you know, with a Masonic symbol on it. Like, just fantastic. Um, I will be going this coming weekend to gaze upon the documents themselves with my kids at the National Archives. Wow. So, um, you know, there will be follow up learning as well. But um, the just it's just so good. It's just so good. Please watch National Treasure if you have not recently. Do not watch the sequel. Thank you. Well, now. Nope. Okay. Mm. Nope. Uh, Nicholas Cage's Jimmy Stewart impersonation is is very good in that. That's my ch- my children were so deeply confused about like what year this movie was made. Like I was like oh, I was made like I don't know twenty years ago, and they were like it seems a lot older. And I was like, well, he's sort of it's in the style of an older movie. And they were like, this movie is from another planet, as far as they were concerned. But um, but they enjoyed it. Uh, Nick, what did you consume? Um, I uh, read the novel How I Won a Nobel Prize uh, by uh, Julius Toronto. Uh, It is a wonderful and scathing parody of contemporary academia that takes place at a university-ish kind of institute founded on an island in sight of New Haven, Connecticut in the Long Island Sound by a shadowy billionaire who brings great scholars of all sorts of different disciplines who have been canceled for one reason or another. And then it follows the travails of a young physicist and her husband, who's a social justice warrior. It is a hilarious and timely Um, satire and parody of contemporary academic mores, as well as critiques of them from the right. Um, Toronto, this is his first novel. Um, I met him briefly uh, last week at a book event uh, that was held uh, for this. The book came out last fall. Um, it It keeps you guessing. It's got a great plot. You know, all of the local uh, uh, kind of jokes work and um, it brings a different lens to bear on kind of academia and intellectual work. I highly, highly recommend how I won a Nobel Prize. Any relation to uh, Wall Street Journal Wiseacre uh, James no. uh, Toronto? <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 of course, I asked that and uh, he, first he thing, yeah. put a uh, cross, made a cross up out of his fingers. No, uh, he is not. Uh, he is not a, an Italian, uh, which is kind of surprising, despite a name, a last name that is uh, a place in Italy. So, but no. uh, Charles, what did you consume? I reread 1984 by George Orwell just because oh, I hadn't boy. read it since I was in high school, and it's really good and i know that sounds wow. facetious but it's like beethoven's fifth where it's just sort of so good that you don't think about it and then you mm. listen to it and then you think wow this really is 
good. And there is a reason that this is famous and is recommended. There's a um, reason why it is no longer taught in high schools. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it's beautifully written. I found some review in which they said it was badly written. I just can't imagine what they think is good writing. It's beautifully written. I'd forgotten how much of the novel is taken up with the love story, which is is because we focus on the politics of it. Um, people, I've said this to you in the last few days, have said, oh, did you read it because of everything that's going on? No, no, it's nothing like that. I don't think we live in that world. I just uh, wanted to reacquaint myself with it. And uh, the other thing about it that struck me was how unflinching it is. There's this scenes in which they describe torture. I don't like violence. I find it difficult to watch violent movies or anything with torture or anything like that. Um, and as a result, I think if I had to sit down and write that book, I think I would pull my punches. But but Orwell just doesn't, which is in character for him. He, he is totally straightforward and unflinching. So if you haven't read it since you were 14, which, which was my predicament, I would reread this book because it's just remarkable. I don't have like you violence. read uh, the book that we are all big fans of here on this podcast, or at least Nick and I are uh, Julia, the the new retelling of. 19- I haven't. I did no. when I was looking up the the book because I wanted to read other people's reviews of it, uh, having read it. Highly I, recommend. I, I did see it's that. Mentioned. Excellent. It's it's a beautiful companion. To it's that. really good. Uh, I uh, consumed, uh, to the surprise of no one who follows my cultural recommendations, <laughs> especially last week since I was in Elmira, New York, going to uh, Mark Twain's famous octagon that uh, I consumed after finishing my previously recommended uh, a three-part uh, Ken Burns documentary on Ernest Hemingway. I began the two-part documentary by Ken Burns on Mark Twain, um, and it's great. I watched that, uh, the first episode last night. Uh, Nick is already preemptively grunting. Um, just if you haven't had injected Mark Twain into your veins in a while, and most of us probably haven't, you should. Um, he uh, is, as he said it very um, modestly himself, the American writer, <laughs> among other things. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's always lovely to be reminded that the author of The Gilded Age uh, tried every single get rich quick scheme he possibly could <laughs> spend all the money on lavish things and then yeah. re-lavished the things and it's just kind of uh it's great for all of that but it's just like uh just like Catherine watching national treasure uh and getting misty-eyed uh, you get the the old american literature right into your veins uh it uh, it feels good nick it makes me feel warm is that what's wrong? your uh, what's your favorite twain matt welch I, I mean, the Huckleberry Finn, um, of course, uh, one yeah. one does that. But Life on the Mississippi is really great. I wrote a huge thing uh, mm-hmm. about Twain when I was in, I think, seventh grade and read basically every single one of his works. And I was uh, uh, very struck by Life on the Mississippi right then, just because it was sort of like straight ahead. This is what it's like to be a steamboat captain. And when you're, uh, you know, a 13 year old boy uh, and you're just being uh, transported back there. And not only that, just the language of it is so it's just so phenomenal and funny and and both antiquated but understandable so i really like that one even though it, it usually is down on most people's list what about you nick gillespie uh i uh, you know what i i mean i like huckleberry finn i i have a soft spot for puddinghead wilson which is a generally considered a failed novel for reasons that are kind of convincing but it's very very funny and it's like a dark if i mean a, to say it's a dark inversion of huckleberry finn is saying a lot, but it is. It's deeply, deeply disturbingly funny in ways that Twain may not have fully meant. Um, but I love Huckleberry Finn. And the thing that cracks me up about it is every every critic, including Hemingway, who said, you know, Huck Finn is like the best we've had, like the best American novel up to that point. They all shit on the moment when Tom Sawyer shows up, uh, you know, spoiler alert. And to me, that's like the best part of the novel where yeah. he completely demythologizes and deconstructs the, you know, the ultimate American boy as just a heartless idiot who does not understand any people, uh, other people's suffering. Um, and that's when the book really takes off and the moral valence of Huck really comes in force. So Huck Finn, this is, you know, it is an absolute shame that that book is not being taught. Uh, the way that it used to because of, you know, the uh, the overuse or not overuse, the use of the N-word 
Um, there is some, you know, I mean, this is banal to say, but that something has gone seriously wrong when one of the greatest works of literature in the American canon that deals specifically with the big single biggest contradiction in American life and mythos is no longer taught. Um, it's and in fact, deeply disturbing. In the uh, in the first episode of of the Twain uh, doc, um, the uh, end of it is uh, all about Huck Finn, and it's very moving to hear from Dick Gregory and from a couple of Twain's uh, scholars who were black uh, talk about this radical notion of this was the first character given actual life in American literature who was black. We haven't had that. Like he's a, he was a person um, and this is how and why we got there and we used it, the language to get there. It's, it's very, very moving and in, like impossible to sustain after watching that any stupid 2024 objection to having Huckleberry Finn in your life. Can I yes. put in one tiny additional recommendation, which is uh, The Literary Offenses of Fenimore Cooper. Such, so good. So good. And just like if ever you need to sit down and write a really, a really negative book <laughs> review, if you just need to like get your bile up, yeah. uh, since that's go. the theme of this podcast, um, The Literary Offenses of, of James Fenimore Cooper, brutal. Uh, all right. Uh, that's all the brutality we have uh, time for here on the Reason Roundtable podcasts. Uh, if you like what we do as an organization, please consider a tax deductible donation. Uh, go to reason.com slash donate for that. Uh, our podcasts live at reason.com slash podcast. Speaking of which, podcast alert. We've got uh, season two of Eric Bames, Why We Can't Have Nice Things, coming out uh, this Thursday. On uh, September 5th, from what I understand, uh, this one is dedicated to America's messed up health care system. Uh, there's prescription drug pricing and availability, state level regulations blocking medical professionals from doing their work, monopoly government intervention and stuff like organ donation. Um, it, all, it all kicks off uh, on Thursday again with special guest Mark Cuban. Uh, he's uh, the co-founder of Cost Plus Drugs which is an attempt to inject some market competition, Catherine likes that, into the prescription drug industry. So go check that stuff out. Uh, Nick, quickly, do we have anything fantastic in New York event-wise that we'd like yes. to do? Uh... Yes, we do. On uh, September 11th, which I believe is a Thursday, uh, we're going to do a live interview with Kat Timpf talking about her new book, I Used to Like You Until dot, 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 How Binary Thinking Divides Us. Um, it's going to be a great night. Go to reason.com slash events to buy the few tickets that still remain. $15 gives you beer, wine, food, and uh, camaraderie. Uh, Catherine, are there more tickets available to your stirring defense over the American dream? Are you just going to be quoting Nicolas Cage right and left? A free press debate in yeah. D.C. on December 10th with Tyler Cowen versus some ne'er-do-wells. Uh, are there any tickets available still on that one? Uh, there are not. Uh, there is, however, going to be a slight change, which is it's going to start a little bit earlier because there's another debate on the same night. Uh, you may have heard the presidential mm. candidates are debating that Ooh. night. Uh, so you can see two debates for the price of one. There will be a uh, watch party for the the other debate, as I would like to think of it, um, after mine. Charles, where can we find your work? Uh, hear your mellifluous voice, and et cetera. Uh, well, you can find my work at National <laughs> Review, and I have a podcast creatively titled The Charles C.W. Cook Podcast, because that's what people Googled. They Googled it. I saw the Google results. I thought that's what I ought to call the what podcast. What does this C.W. stand for? Uh, that's my middle name. It's Christopher William. Not Concealed Weapon, as some have asked, okay. unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, there's always Twitter. Sadly. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you very much, Charles, for your contribution. People have been asking. They've been like, when are you going to get that Charles Cook on? So uh, oh, we you. did it for you. Uh, listener, uh, listener request. Uh, thanks for that again. And we'll catch us next week on the actual Monday. Goodbye.